Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, let the PR games begin. The global media are descending on Sochi. What stories are they going to tell there? Al Jazeera journalists in Egypt. Five are already behind bars. Now the authorities have issued arrest warrants for many more. The next time you're at a news event, look up. You might see a drone looking at you. And office etiquette, the good and the bad. Someone in your office will creep you out. That's our web video of the week. Next week, Russia will be hosting the world and the global news media at the Winter Olympics in Sochi. Consider the cost, $51 billion. Then compare it to what came before, Vancouver in 2010 at just $8 billion. It's been a huge endeavor for the Kremlin that amounts to a public relations megaproject. And the news coverage may well determine if the Russians get value for money. Journalists in Sochi are using these games as a news peg to get at other stories about Russia. There's the contentious gay propaganda law, the environmental impact of the Sochi development projects, and of course the enormous cost to the taxpayer. Most of the Russian news media haven't even waited for the torch to get lit to declare Sochi a triumph. Step by step through the Putin years, the Russian media, particularly on the broadcast side, have been brought to heel. The president and his inner circle can manage the message through media directly or indirectly controlled by the state. Journalism can be a dangerous game in Russia. Pushing the boundaries can get foreign reporters expelled and it can get Russian reporters killed. These are the Olympics that the Kremlin wanted. Now we're about to find out how it likes the news coverage that always comes with hosting the games. Our starting point this week is Sochi. that the 22nd Olympic Winter Games in 2014 are awarded to the city of Sochi. The main target was to show a kind of new face of Russia. Because Cold War stereotypes and negative attitudes toward Russia are still rife in the West. There is a blizzard of allegations of unsavory ties. On state television, the games are presented in a positive light, and Putin is the star. You have immense political pressure to you, the pro-government line. And they don't have to be reminded of what that line is. To be fair to President Putin, there isn't a political leader anywhere who, when the Olympics come to their country, doesn't try to transform the games into personal political capital. But Vladimir Putin has taken that notion and run with it, skied with it, and skated with it. Always with dutiful Russian cameras in tow. Putin is everywhere. We see him visiting the venues uh, in Sochi, inspecting uh, the area. We see him skating with President Belarus Alexander Lukashenko and former NHL star Slava Fetisov, Pavel Bure. He's in the heart of the action, and these are his games. And we see this in a positive light because this is his project. It's time to show the world that Russia is a strong nation, that it's a modern one, uh, that it can win on the international stage as well as at the rink uh, and on the slope. For Moscow, for President Putin, and for the Russian people, it represents, amongst other things, the opportunity to show what the country has achieved in recent years, to demonstrate, once again, Russia's influence is growing. It would be good to ask the residents of Sochi what they make of it all, but you're hardly likely to find any coverage of that in the official media. The reaction has been unambiguous. For them, it has been, well, to call it a natural disaster would be too much, but they see it as something like that especially the people who were evicted from their homes and who, if they were paid any compensation, then it was almost nothing. Complaints over Olympic-grade construction projects are not unique to Sochi. They come with the games wherever they are held. But official Russia is not interested in the reporting of that story. Over the past three months, news crews from Norway and the Czech Republic say they've been repeatedly detained in Sochi and threatened with jail time. And back in 2010, NTV, a channel owned by the energy giant Gazprom, which is closely tied to the Kremlin, aired a documentary saying Sochi residents critical of the games were just feckless malcontents out for some of that Olympic money. Who 
Who owns NTV? It's Gazprom, so it's clear. If this had stood out as the only program of its kind by NTV, perhaps it would have generated some surprise, irritation or even protest. But it's by no means the only such program on the channel. There is a whole brigade, a whole part of NTV that has long since stopped working as a news outlet, as journalists, but are now instead propagandists of the very worst sort. They want to show to the audience, which still has faith in the state-run media, that uh, there are no legitimate objections to what they're doing. Anyone who complains or raises issues connected to the Olympics is doing so either because they are being paid by foreigners or because they're malicious. All these people are, are legitimate targets in the eyes of the regime for dis, to, uh, defamation and discreditation. David Satter would be in a position to know. He recently became the first American journalist expelled from Russia since the Cold War. The authorities say it was over visa issues. He says he was told his presence was undesirable. Between last year's Pussy Riot and Greenpeace stories, which led to the jailing and eventual release of groups critical of the government, the Kremlin is taking a hard line with its political opponents. On those stories and on the gay propaganda law, the bulk of the Russian media have backed the government. When the state-owned channel Russia One invited an American journalist to discuss the law on homosexuality, the moderator sounded considerably less than moderate. Russian media has taken something that was not necessarily an issue and made it, made it an issue. We have Dmitry Kasilyov who said that hearts of homosexuals who die in car accidents should be burned and buried in the ground. You have these homophobic comments that come from state-owned media and from actors who are supported. That's when it becomes problematic. The state-controlled media is, is important because it, it reaches to all parts of the country. It reaches outside Moscow and Leningrad. It's also important because Russians, by and large, get their news from television, not from the press and not from the internet. Something like 80% of Russians get their news overwhelmingly from the state-controlled national media, television media. So uh, it is a very powerful instrument. The Listening Post contacted the Kremlin and four other government offices for comment on this story. None replied, and neither the state-owned Russia One or NTV made anyone available. We did, however, get interviews with journalists at two state-owned outlets, the head of Ria Novosti's Olympic Service and the editor-in-chief of Russia Direct on government control of the media in general and Sochi coverage in particular. I myself, as editor-in-chief of Russia Direct, have never experienced any form of pressure. I've never been told what to write or what not to write on the Olympics. We've just published a whole series of articles, a special issue about Sochi, safety, investment, the costs and the benefits to Russia in the long run. We found experts and we put the questions to them. We didn't tell them what to write or what not to write. Probably half a year ago, there were a lot of criticism regarding, regarding preparation. Uh, to the games, but uh, I think that uh, closer to the games focus of media coverage has started to shift uh, towards uh, sport itself. People do not always want to hear how miserable all this uh, process of preparation is, and they want to hear more some success stories. And that's what the Russian media, both state-owned and nominally independent, will give them. In a few short days, the world will tune in to the Winter Olympics. It will be a tale of one city and two stories, news narratives that, like the athletes, will be in competition. Our Global Village Voice is now on the news coverage of the upcoming Sochi Games. The Olympics in Sochi are seen by many in Russia as an opportunity to attract attention to the conditions we live in the country. Therefore, it's hardly surprising that journalists were mostly focused on such issues as corruption, the pressure on activists and surveillance measures deployed in the area. Very few of these stories were produced by Russian journalists, and this is a sign in itself of how difficult the situation is for Russian journalists. The Olympic Charter actually mandates that the International Olympic Committees and the host cities ensure the fullest range of media coverage 
What will be interesting, however, will be the social media output from the people on the ground. And with that comes the increasing realization that the spectators are reflecting, they are problematizing certain issues and things that they are seeing with the Olympic movement. So the games are being more and more co-authored and co-produced by audiences. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. At last, some clarity on the legal status of Al Jazeera journalists held in Egyptian jails, and the news is not good for them or their colleagues. Five Al Jazeera journalists have been behind bars awaiting trial, and now the authorities say arrest warrants have been issued for another 12 unnamed employees who they say either currently work for Al Jazeera or have done in the past. The prosecutors have said the Al Jazeera staff had, quote, undermined national unity by broadcasting false information. Most of the accused are said to be Egyptian nationals charged with membership in a terrorist organization, the Muslim Brotherhood. Al Jazeera says it's had no journalists reporting from Egypt since December 29th, the day that Al Jazeera English producers Mohammed Fahmi and Bar Mohammed, as well as correspondent Peter Gresta, were all arrested. Two more employees from the network's Arabic language channels, Abdullah Al Shami and Mohammed Badr, have been in detention for more than five months already. Al Jazeera calls the charges absurd and continues to demand the prisoners' unconditional release. The network has been backed on that in a petition signed by nearly 50 journalists from international media outlets. And media watch organizations have condemned the Egyptian government over the allegation that Al Jazeera is colluding with terrorist groups. Edward Snowden, the former NSA contractor who blew the whistle on mass surveillance by U.S. and British spy agencies, has taken a bruising in the media, particularly in the U.S. Now he's giving some of that back. Snowden used an interview with the New Yorker magazine to accuse the U.S. mainstream media of abdicating their responsibility to hold power to account. He was talking about interviews done January 19th by Mike Rogers and Diane Feinstein. I believe there's a reason he ended up in the hands uh, the loving arms of an FSB agent in Moscow. The two head congressional intelligence committees both mused aloud on the possibility that Snowden, who's exiled in Moscow, has been working for the Russians all along. Snowden denies that and said, it's not the smears that mystify me. It's that outlets report statements that the speakers themselves admit are sheer speculation. He added, it's just amazing that these massive media institutions don't have any sort of editorial position on this. I mean, these are pretty serious allegations. The Associated Press says it will no longer work with an award-winning photojournalist after he admitted to digitally tampering with a picture taken in Syria. Mexican photographer Narciso Contreras was one of five journalists awarded a Pulitzer Prize for their work there last year. The photo in question was taken four months ago in the northwestern city of Idlib. It shows a rebel fighter ducking for cover. The original shows a camera in the bottom left-hand corner, but in the image Contreras submitted, that camera had been removed. The alteration breached AP's editorial policy. Its director of photography, Santiago Lyon, said AP's reputation is paramount. Deliberately removing elements from our photographs is completely unacceptable. Contreras eventually admitted his manipulation, said he did it because he felt the camera would be a distraction. He also said, I took the wrong decision when I removed the camera. I feel ashamed about that, but it happened to me, so I have to assume the consequences. When someone says the word drone, it's usually followed by the word strike. Given the stories we keep hearing out of places like Pakistan and Yemen, we've become conditioned to think of drones as weapons of war. They're also becoming tools of the journalistic trade. Because whether you realize it or not, more and more news stories, particularly those on television, now include images shot by drones. There are still a lot of issues to be worked out, some of them technological, some ethical. However, drones are becoming part of the news gathering process and because they can provide a different perspective and they're not as expensive as one might think, you can bet they're here to stay. The Listening Post's Will Young now on the potential and some of the pitfalls of the media's unmanned eyes in the skies. November 2013, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. A camera carried by an unmanned aerial vehicle or UAV floats overhead high enough to capture the scale of the destruction, yet close enough to convey the detail and depth of the tragedy. The footage, shot by a British freelancer, was picked up by CNN, who also hired him to shoot their reporter on the scene. The possibility for drones in the hands of journalists and activists is it's really quite significant. It seems obvious at the moment that if you want to show widespread devastation after a fire or environmental problems, that drones can help illustrate that. If you're at a protest and you have a drone, you can, for example, 
put a drone up in the air and see the tactics that the police are using, see the extent of it and really give a kind of whole different illustrative angle to the coverage that you're trying to produce. And it's at political protests where drones are getting closest to where news is breaking. A drone shot the demonstrations that shook Bangkok at the end of last year. The footage quickly became part of the mainstream media coverage. But it was at the Occupy protests of 2011 where journalist Tim Poole first saw how a drone could help report times of civil unrest. I've known about drones and, and remote control airplanes and blimps and all that stuff, but it wasn't until there was this particular protest in Boston where the police formed a line and they were blocking the press from being able to film the arrests happening behind them that, uh, that I started to think, but what can I do that's legal to circumvent their blockade? And a friend of mine suggested we grab a couple of these drones, send them straight into the sky, we'll have an aerial shot, totally legal, we'll get a better vantage point, how can we incorporate this? In the Gezi Park protests in Turkey, when tens of thousands of people were clashing with police, the whole time I was there, I did not see a single news camera flying over the place. There was uh, another uh, guy, um, goes by the name of Jenks, uh, online who used a DJI, DJI Phantom just like this, where uh, he flew around uh, protests in Istanbul, Turkey and was actually getting some really amazing shots of confrontations between the police and protesters. So in that case, the aerial shots from the drones were the only ones we got off the whole park. Uh, and they were, I mean, as far as I know, they were just put on YouTube and websites. And I believe on the second day that he was flying it around, uh, police shot it out of the sky. Uh, you can hear semi-automatic weapon fire and then it just falls to the ground. Gezi Park showed how contentious journalism drones can be over politically sensitive situations. But for technology better known for its military applications, in the world of commercial photography and footage, the argument has been settled. Drone pilot Toby Pocock has never flown his hexacopter to cover breaking news. He puts cameras in the sky for corporate customers instead. We've got quite a, a varied range of clients, ranging from the likes of Rolls-Royce right through to property companies. When it comes to drones, they want to put a camera into a position which hasn't been possible before. Helicopters are restricted to how low they can fly, and obviously because we make a lot less noise and we're a lot smaller than a full-size helicopter, it means that we are much more responsive. A lot of news organizations will pay for exclusive access to the roof of a building or sending up a, a helicopter could cost thousands of dollars. But drone technology is tremendously cheaper. The model I use is only a few hundred dollars. It can be f flown with a mobile app, so the, the point of entry at which a journalist can figure out how to use it is very low, and the cost is very low. Journalists, armed with easily available drones, have already run into the long arm of the law. In June 2013, a South African filmmaker was arrested after flying a drone around the hospital where the late Nelson Mandela was being treated. In August, Swiss police confiscated images taken by a photographer who flew his drone over the wall at a celebrity wedding. In both cases, journalists were criticised for chasing famous faces, and given that the media are often accused of invading the privacy of public figures, could drones give image-hungry news hounds another way to dog their targets? From above? People ask me all the time, well, what if the paparazzi gets these? What if the paparazzi gets these? One, they already have them. There are laws that bar people from looking in other people's windows, like sneaking up to somebody's house and looking in there, but those laws are often predicated on you being physically on the property. Well, with a UAV, you don't have to be there anymore. It seems like a natural right not to be photographed against your will in your backyard, fenced in, but drones are promising to violate that. I think a lot of people will be quite understandably creeped out by the idea that if you're outside anywhere, anywhere in your home, in your backyard, if you're just outside, you may potentially be photographed. With so many issues unresolved, mainstream media have used drones sparingly far away from built-up areas where safety issues and regulation are unlikely to be an issue. There's something about the culture of mainstream media which is normally fairly cautious about pulling in and uh, risking things with new technology. 
Mainstream media at the moment has been very hesitant to take up drones. The BBC, for example, is going step by step, training their people very slowly. But it's also there's aspects of drones that slow things down. You've got battery life on small drones is normally quite low, so you can really only fly these things for kind of 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, it's hard, you've got to practice a fair bit to get a really good steady shot that tells the story that you want to tell. Coming at it from a flying point of view and the fact that we have to be CAA qualified for this, immediately I think of all of the restrictions that we would have on us before you could use it for journalism. Of course, yeah, great, stick a camera up in the air, there's a riot going on down here or there's something that we need to go and check out. It's fantastic, but there may be breaking rules and regulations to be putting the drone into here in the first place. Over the coming months, the organization responsible for regulating airspace in the US, the FAA, will consider revising laws that restrict drone use. That could mean more experimentation to see how a drone's eye view can enhance news coverage. Because, as with any new technology, it's not about what drones can do, it's about what journalists can do with drones. I think you are absolutely seeing a period of experimentation. I think that the limitations right now primarily have to do with law and safety. But once those begin to relax, I think you're going to see a lot more creativity in how they're used. The best scenario would be a genuine discussion about safety and privacy. So we had a reasonable compromise that could exploit these technologies without just kind of surrendering. I think it's much better for policymakers to be proactive rather than looking at technology as some force of nature that just is going to happen because it's not. You know, we make these things, we can decide how to use them. More Global Village Voices now on the use of drones in journalism. I think drones do fall under the same ethical debate that photojournalists have been struggling with for decades. Is it ethical to use a telephoto lens to photograph something that would be impossible to see with the naked eye? Is it ethical to use a hidden camera to photograph someone without them knowing? I do think that drone technology does have the potential to be abused, but it has so much more opportunity to benefit people. Uh, I think privacy is, is a concern, but it's a bit overstated uh, because this technology is still very limited in its capabilities. But I think the single biggest obstacle for drones to be adopted by journalists is uh, the ease of use. There's still a big learning curve, um, and we need to get to a point where a journalist can just press a button and um, the drone takes care of it, the rest. So basically what, what we really need is, is not drones so much as aerial robots. And finally, those of you who are meant to be working right now but are watching our program online instead may identify with the following video. People with desk jobs probably spend more time at the office with their colleagues than with their own families. The video is called 15 Things That Inevitably Happen When You Work in an Office. It was produced by BuzzFeed, and it's touched a nerve with a lot of desk jockeys and office workers. That's why it's got more than a million hits online, and we've made it our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. You will begin your time working in an office wearing your finest clothing, only to wind up not giving a Regardless of your best intentions, you will develop an addiction to caffeine. No matter what your relationship status, you will develop some sort of crush on a co-worker. You will fall into one of two camps, the people who are always freezing or the people who are constantly hot. You will start with one personal item in your office drawer and then one day you'll open it up and realize your entire life is in there. Someone in your office will creep you out. And you will bond with someone else over mutually being creeped out. You will get exceptionally good at hiding Facebook on your computer. You'll gain at least five pounds of fat from all the birthday cookies, cakes, and red velvet cupcakes. At some point, you'll bring a personal friend to visit and it will be unexpectedly awkward to introduce them to anyone you work with. You will get really excited about being good at some small task, and then hate it once everyone else starts asking you to do it for them. And you will form a group of friends in that office who will make every day a whole lot better.